library because they've worked so hard to get this all together. And our board of trustees and our friends at the library for helping make this event happen. And also a special thank you to Taylor Catfish for all our great food tonight. Um, I had just started working here at the library in 1997 when Larry gave a speech at the reception for our new edition, and his words were really inspiring to me. Um, he spoke about how much this library meant to him, and he said, the library is for everybody, and that may be the single greatest thing about it. And he's right, because I'm still here after 17 years, <laughs> and I still feel lucky every day to have this job. When Larry chose the public library to be the nonprofit organization to benefit from his Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Award. I was so excited. Um, we were able to host public readings and writing workshops for a great list of authors. And I got to pick up one of my favorite authors from the airport in Memphis, Jill McCorkle. So I'll never forget that. And that was a once in a lifetime moment. We could not be happier to be designated a literary landmark in honor of Larry Brown for everything he did for us at the library. So now I'm gonna introduce our speakers for this evening. Dr. Jay Watson is the Howery Professor of Faulkner Studies at the University of Mississippi. And in 2007, his book, Conversations with Larry Brown, was published to great acclaim. When I found out that Jonathan Miles was going to be in town to do a reading at Square Books in November, I knew we had to plan this event around his appearance. Johnny was very close to Larry and all of his family. And I want to thank him for coming to Oxford a day early so that he could be here this evening. And his reading for his new novel, Want Not, is tomorrow night at Square Books, and I think everyone should attend. <laughs> um, and Shane, Shane Brown, is Larry's youngest son, and he is not only a successful high school football coach and father, he has also just recently started a blog about Larry called The Brown Effect, and it is wonderful, I can't recommend it enough, you should all be reading it. So we'll start with Jane Watson. Thank you. Thanks. I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Laura Beth for inviting me to be part of a really wonderful occasion and to join uh, Larry's family and his friends in, uh, in celebrating a moment that he had a lot to do with making possible. Um, I'm going to try not to wear out my welcome, keep, keep the remarks uh, kind of brief, and, but also to showcase some of Larry's own words about the library from uh, a speech he gave here about 16 years ago for the, um, the opening of the new edition. One of the great lessons that I take away from Larry's life as a writer, and it's one that he pointed out many times in his own teaching, is that writers learn to write by writing. He didn't talk a lot when we talked at all this about improving his students' writing. It was more about encouraging them and inspiring them to put on, to put in the long hours and the hard work that goes into a literary apprenticeship. To set an example, to be a role model for craft and discipline and dedication. What he talked about less often, but I think he might have believed just as deeply, is that writers learn to write by reading. And that's what makes a library such an incredibly important place. And I think there are really two aspects of this. One, the imaginative journeys that he took in books helped him later to understand what sort of journeys he wanted to take readers on when he took up the craft. And he talks a little bit about those journeys in his speech. He said, one of the greatest things about books is their ability to transport into other times and other places through a journey of the mind. By reading some of the books in these shelves, I've been able to follow Peter Hathaway Capstick through heat and dust as he hunted man-eating lions in Africa, and to ride with Stonewall Jackson on the night he was hit by his own men, and to be in a wrecked airliner with the survivors of the Andes crash in bitter cold and deep snow. He read alive that book about cannibalism. <laughs> I've been able to share in these adventures through the power of the written word and through the dedication of men and women who sit down at a typewriter or a computer screen or even a pad of paper and a pencil to try and render a piece of history or a shared experience in what it is to be human. And I think that inspired him and it gave him models to write to and to write by in his own life. And then there were books that he found here about the craft itself, about writing. Mama. But what he learned from these books wasn't a set of tricks or techniques, but an attitude toward the craft. <coughs> the same attitude that he tried to create in his students, 
one of commitment to hard work and demanding the very best from yourself. He talked a little bit about these craft books in his speech as well. He says, in the old days, back in the early 80s, when I had decided that I wanted to write, I came to the library for help, and I found it here. There were shelves of books by fiction writers on the craft of writing, and I would go out of here with armloads of them. I found guidance in those books and encouragement. I read how John D. McDonald, the creator of Travis McGee, called up his courage one afternoon and burned 300,000 words, his own pages, in the backyard with his son supervising the fire. He felt that the words, those particular early words he had written, were no good and were better off being destroyed. And I remembered that when I burned one of my own early novels one day. I read about the years that other writers worked without selling what they wrote, and I realized that I was not alone, that mine was not a unique experience among writers, and that rejection slips, hundreds of them, were not uncommon. That gave me the strength to keep going, to keep writing, and finally to publish my first book. The second thing I want to say <clears throat> excuse me, about Larry is that I think what made books special for him wasn't just the stories they told or the information they contained. <coughs> Larry had a kind of love affair with books as a very, very special sort of object in their own right. Listen to him tell the story of discovering Cormac McCarthy's great novel, Sutry, at this library. I had never heard of this man or any of his work, but one lucky day I saw a pretty book with a nice black spine. And I pulled it from the shelf and opened it up and read a few paragraphs, and that was all I needed to see. I closed it, tucked it under my arm, and hurried down to the checkout desk to get this treasure home as quickly as I could and start reading it. He's talking about an object, an artifact of a very important kind, a very unique sort. And part of the riddle of becoming an author for him was discovering not just how books got written, but as he often put in his own words, how books got made, how these wonderful things you could hold in your hand got made. <coughs> he says, a book is a thing you can hold in your hand, something that comes from the hand of man as simple and as solid as a brick in its outside form, as intricate and complex in his pages as a painting from a great master or a carving from an Italian sculptor dead 500 years. When you feel that way about books, when you feel that reverently about the books themselves, it's only natural that you come to feel that way about the physical spaces where books live, the places like bookstores and libraries. And it's very clear from his speech in 1997 that he felt a special kind of love for this library. He says, I guess you have to love books first in order to love the buildings where they're housed as well, but to me there's a special feeling about them when I walk inside one. I gave a reading at the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C., and it didn't matter that it was huge, that it was filled with millions of books, and was loaded with people who were strangers to me. It still felt comfortable and welcoming and warm. It felt like home. And when I walk in this place, it always feels like home. I think that's really it in a nutshell, and I think Larry would be very just delighted to see this library being celebrated as a landmark. I think for Larry, all libraries were landmarks in a way, and so it's, uh, it's a meaningful occasion to see this library get its cue as one. So thank you very much for your time. I want to thank Laura Beth uh, and the library for inviting me here today. This is a complete honor and privilege just as it was an honor and a privilege and a infinite, sometimes crazy pleasure to have called Larry a friend. And uh, I know the word never actually passed between us as a mentor. I was 21 years old when I met Larry, and I was sitting on a bar stool at City Grocery. And I had just published a short story in a uh, little alternative weekly paper called South Five. It was my first published short story. I think I knew who Larry was. I'd certainly never read his work. But Larry came up to me and, and asked if I was the one who had written that story. I said yes. And he immediately invited me to dinner uh, downstairs to the grocery with his wife. Now, what happened at the dinner has become something of a little wild legend. Um, 
I'm not going to go into what happened on Jeff and Samaria. Um, Larry hated that story too. But suffice it to say that by the end of that meal, I realized I had encountered the most spectacularly brilliant, and fascinating, and amazing man that I'd ever, I'd ever met. And also, what was the woman I'd ever met. You know, a few months ago, I realized that I had just turned the age that Larry was when he met me. And then something else occurred to me, that I would no more invite an aspiring 21-year-old writer to <laughs> dinner with me than I would want to wrestle a rabid alligator. <laughs> um, there were many lessons that Larry taught me that kind of generosity cannot be taught. Because Larry's generosity was epic. I was not the only scraggly young writer to have, um, he, that he went out of his way to help. In fact, the phrase generous to a fault comes to mind. I remember fishing out at uh, two of the and where he was talking about a book that he read. And Larry was never uh, unkind to talk about books, but he said it was the worst book he had ever read in his life. And it was 700 pages of badness. He was going on about this book, and, and he said, you know, I'm only probably about 100 pages from being finished. so bad, why are you finishing it? He said, well, there was a kid in Iowa, somewhere like that, that had sent it to him. I said, well, you don't have to finish it. And he looked at me like I had just said the most unthinkable rudeness in the world. He just said, well, he sent it to me. <laughs> <laughs> there was a poet, I remember, uh, that landed in Oxford, landed out in Yaki to, to come here. Some, some lessons, some guidance from Larry. And he ended up staying for weeks and weeks and weeks. And after a while, Mary's patience had grown understandably thin. She was ready for a poet free household. But Larry said he couldn't leave uh, because the, the brakes in his car weren't working. And Mary said, he doesn't need brakes to leave. <laughs> But I think Larry's greatest gift to me was, was his example of persistence, of a kind of artistic determination that truly, still when I think about it, is nothing short of jaw-dropping. And it continues to galvanize me. And what's beautiful about today is um, so much of that determination found its inspiration here in the stacks of this library. It's former generation. After Larry died, I helped Mary with the hard crushing task of cataloging and helping to organize his papers into very good stuff. And as we were going through the books and writing down the titles, I kept finding myself surprised, not by the books that were there, but by the books that weren't there, by the absences that I kept discovering. Larry owned a lot of, a lot of books, but many of them, and maybe even the majority, were recent titles books that he had purchased or received after he started publishing. And what became apparent is that many of the formative books that he had talked about over the years were missing from his personal library. Uh, I think of uh, Cormac McCarthy, Cormac McCarthy's Sutra, which uh, was a book that, slight digression, uh, I discovered in square books one day, sort of freely, randomly, sounded interesting, picked it up, went out to fish with Larry. Tula, and I said, I've been shopping, and I picked up this book called Sutra. I don't think I ever heard him talk about it. And uh, I said, do you know about this book? <laughs> and uh, without missing a beat, he nods, and he says, and I have to read this, but he didn't. Dear friend, now in the dusty, clothless hours of the town, when the streets lie black and steaming in the wake of water trucks, and now when the drunk and the homeless have washed up in the lee of walls and alleys or abandoned lots, and cats go forth high-shouldered and lean in the grim perimeters about. Now in these soot-black brick or cobbled corridors where light wire shadows make a gothic harp of cellar doors, no soul shall walk save you. And then he cast. I looked at him and I said, so you read it. <laughs> But that book 
wasn't in Larry Stacks, and neither were the John D. McDonald novels that he often cited, neither were Flannery O'Connor and the early Harry Cruz. And this was a mystery to me at first, until I realized those books were here. The library. This was where Larry had forged himself as a writer. This is where he had encountered the books that had lit that incredible fire within him and where he absorbed the rhythms and the melodies of great prose that he turned into the, the, the melodies and rhythms of his prose that was good and then great and then greater still and then amazing. Back in 97, as Jay noted, Larry gave that speech and I was going to quote that, but there's, there's, there's one line that I find so important. He said, the books that he found here gave me the strength to keep going, to keep writing, and to publish my first book. So this honor for him today, I think, goes far beyond the word appropriate. It comes a lot closer to the word perfect. What Larry did here, at the least, is a reminder of how essential and how life-giving our public libraries are. And his example should inspire us in this new age of informational blood and government cuts and all that to work ever harder to preserve and strengthen the mission that our libraries have. But I think Larry's example also goes beyond that as well. It should serve as a guiding light to everyone who enters here, who comes here. This is a place for dreaming. This is the place that Larry dreamed of a life made richer by literature. It's where he dreamed of broadcasting the voice and the voice, voices of the people that he knew and loved into the wider world. And this is where he found the tools to make that dream possible. Musicians often talk about going into the woodshed uh, you know, to, to practice and practice and to absolutely hone the craft to get the sounds right. And this was Larry's woodshed. And I know he'd be honored and thrilled by this commemoration. Thank you so much. A great and humbling thank you to Miss Laura Beth Walker. If not for her, we would all not be gathered here today, celebrating what helped start Dad's career. She did not have to apply for the designation of the literary landmark, but she did on behalf of Dad and for all he did for this library. She appreciated the Larry Brown's Writer Series and his constant patriotism into, inside of these walls. Laura Beth also wanted Lafayette County, the city of Oxford, and the University of Mississippi to be appreciated by the mutual respect Dad and they shared. Thank you, Laura Beth. Next, I would like to thank all of Dad's friends and fans that are here, all his supporters and readers, and of course, without you too, we wouldn't be here tonight. I thank you. Mr. Paul Hill, Mr. Tom Rankin, and Mr. Richard Hogarth are three special men in my life and my family's life. Without you three guys, I don't know if we would be here tonight either. You helped us off through Dad's determination, and the Browns love you, cherish you, and thank you. Thank you, Aunt Joy, Uncle Daryl, and Uncle Knox for your support in him and for us. Lastly, I want to say thank you to my family for why we are here tonight. You are the strongest group of wonderful people that I've ever been around. Johnny, you came in Dad's life at such a great time. You brought him energy and excitement and, of course, amusement. He loves you like a son. I consider you my brother. So does Lee and Billy Ray. And Dad loved Kathleen Ladd as a daughter, too. We miss y'all. Billy Ray, you were Dad's pride, his firstborn. As much as you tended to piss him off, this title never got away from you. He loved your wittiness and humor. He was fond of you and your success as a farmer. Can you believe how happy he is now? <laughs> he would also tell you how smart of a man you were for Mary and Paula Clepsy. <laughs> we love you, Paula. Leanne, you were dad's baby girl. That may not sound great to you now as you're older, but it did to him and does to me and every other man that is privileged, privileged to say that about his daughter. He loves your beauty, your heart, and your charm. He would be ecstatic with the woman and mother you are today. With as hard as you believe it, he loves you too. <laughs> Mom, this recognition tonight is a lot about you too. We would not have never been here tonight if it was not for you and your strength and love for dad. I love you, Mom, and I consider myself, Leanne, Billy Ray, and John very fortunate to tell you, Mom. 
I think of Dad often. I'm not going to say that I think of him every day since he has been gone, but it's close. I miss him dearly, and something instantly changed when he was no longer around the house. I think my family would agree with that. I'm sure this is true for everyone who has lost a loved one. Dad was a lot of different things to me, but the greatest was that he was my father. I am often told him that I am his twin. I know I look like him and act like him, but I will never compare my knowledge of the words and stories that he wrote to the way I think and talk. I consider him to be one of the best authors I have ever read. I am not being partial, just being a fan. The father Larry Brown was much different than most, or was he? He was very kind, polite, and humorous to us. Of course he had his moments when we acted too badly, but most dads do. Who can blame someone for getting mad when their two sons put exploding sticks in a cigarette pack after the lawnmower breaks down in 100 degree heat in Mississippi? <laughs> I have never seen Bill Ray run that fast. <laughs> we would often wake up on school mornings to the bangs of pots and pans. Sometimes dad would stay up all night to write and he would still be awake while we were getting ready for our day. He would sing, get up, and smash the pots and pans rapidly. It would drive us crazy and he would giggle while we woke up. I miss his kindness and the way he cared for us. He always made sure that his wife and children had what they wanted first because he was content with the things he had. He always wanted me to do right and be respectful. I remember when company would come over, he would remind us to use our manners. He taught me how to fish and he taught me how to be kind. I'm a pretty good carpenter because he was a great one. You should see how neat he kept the riding cabin that he built at our place in Tula. He finished building it not too long he passed and was only able to write a little of the miracle of catfish on a legal pad with a pen. He also taught me about being patient. He was slow and careful with almost everything he did. He was slow to drive a truck, slow to write a book, slow to come to supper, and slow with his words. Maybe that was the way he was, or maybe it was just the way he wanted us to wanted to teach us to do. He also taught us to love and care for animals. He always had, we always had dogs or cats in our home. He took a hardware store and bought the most expensive leashes and collars. He would go on these one hour walks with Lily and try to teach her to use the bathroom. He read about different tricks in the book that he could do while walking with her and he would practice them. He would fuss at us if we talked to Lily while they were doing their business. Even still he could never housebreak her and that drove him insane. <laughs> He would even argue that it wasn't his dog using the bathroom in the house. It was Mom's. <laughs> Mom had a chihuahua, so the size of the dogs easily showed who the real culprit was. <laughs> it was obvious that it was Lily, but he didn't seem to agree. My brother even gave Dad a nickname about his inspections of findings in the house. Dad finally ended up giving Lily away to a friend of his. He bought some cows later in life. He thought it was cool being a cattle farmer like Billy Ray. Cattle were easy for him to raise, plus he had Billy Ray to help him. Dad thought hawks were amazing creatures too. He would describe their beauty and his love to watch them soar through the sky looking for their next meal. Or he would, or he would sit and watch them at the top of a tree watching for rabbits or other rodents. I see hawks often now. I saw eight on a trip back home this summer. A hawk flew in front of my old truck's windshield when I bought an engagement ring in the city of Memphis. I saw them almost every day on my way to work and back home and it gave me a sense of peace during the struggling times. One of the last men to leave the gravesite at Dad's funeral watched a hawk lift from the tree lines that covered his grave and fly away. To this day, I smile when I see a hawk and often say, hey. We are fortunate to have his books and movies. My kids, his grandchildren, will always be able to hear his voice and see his face. His documentary is something that is so special to me, and we will always thank Gary Hawkins, which indeed will never be enough. He was an awesome dad, and we love him and miss him very much. In closing, I'm going to read the ending of Dad's speech he gave here in 1997 when they added a new addition to the library. This place was second home to, to Dad, and he visited here and cared about this place a lot. I was talking to Leanne last week, and she told me the story of the day we went with Dad to get our library cars for the first time here. I remember Bill Ray reading encyclopedia after encyclopedia as we were growing up. I had most of Matt Christopher's books ever published and a few subscriptions to sporting magazines. I remember mom always sitting on the couch after supper cooking, <clears throat> after supper was cooked, watching TV and reading a book. Dad at times would read two books at once as he was writing on one. My son Maddox, at age seven, reads at a fourth grade level. 
My daughter Riley has started reading, and I encourage it to her. In my opinion, reading is the utmost important thing in a child's life, and it should continue as adults. The speech that the speech that Dad wrote explained this more, and I'm sure Laura Beth can get your hands on a copy if you're interested. Dad's closing speech. In closing, I would like to say that I personally am grateful for this building and its contents and for the people who work here. And I know that many other people who live here share the same feelings. Now we have this wonderful new wing, adding more space and light, more room for books, more services, more knowledge to be shared. For the libraries of the world <clears throat> are the repositories of knowledge, everything that has passed down from the people who lived before us. All the things that women and men have learned up to the present day and continue to learn. Everything documented, our wars, our failures as human beings, but also our triumphs in peace and education, the curing the disease that used to ravage us. All of them recorded here in all their ugliness and beauty. As we as, as, we as species are reach, reaching for knowing that what has come before, and in the case of fiction, to be able to see what a human's imagination can create when turned loose and left boundless. What we do in the de these days will be recorded too for the ones who come along after us to read about. As long as people want to read, there will be libraries for them. And I have no fear that in whatever le electronic age is ahead of us, we'll lose the simple pleasure of opening a book and beginning to turn the pages. A book is a thing you can hold in your hand. Something that comes from the hand of man. As simple and solid as a brick in its outside form. As intricate and complex as its pages in the painting from a great master or a carbon from Italian sculpture dead 500 years. Books like people will probably evolve and change, but I don't worry that they will ever cease to exist. All we have to do as, peop all we have to do as people is keep teaching our children to read, and the rest will more than likely take care of itself. To me, that's what the library is all about, and I'm glad we've got one here that can we all be proud of. Thanks for listening.